Since 1789, other nations' constitutions have come and gone. Uh, by one recent estimate, the average lifespan of a national constitution is 17 years, which is roughly about how long a house cat lives. Um, by contrast, the US Constitution is more like a redwood tree. Uh, it not only has endured for several hundred years, uh, but it thrives. And my question is, why is that so? The reason the United States Constitution uh, is the world's most enduring written constitution is not simply the genius of 55 men who gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of, 19, of, of 1787. Rather, it's the way that generation after generation of Americans has made the Constitution our Constitution. The Constitution endures because its meaning and its application have been shaped by an ongoing process of interpretation. That process includes judicial interpretation as well as transformations in constitutional understanding pressed by political leaders and by ordinary citizens throughout our history. Our Constitution retains its vitality because it's proven adaptable to the changing conditions and evolving values that our society has. Its words and principles still resonate centuries after they were written because time and again, as Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes reminded us, we have interpreted the Constitution in light of what this nation has become. Justice Holmes was right when he wrote that the Constitution has called into being a life the development of which could not have been foreseen completely by the most gifted of its begetters. It was enough for them to realize or hope that they had created an organism. It has taken a century and has cost their successors much sweat and blood to prove they created a nation. Those words were true a century ago and they remain true today. So Americans of all backgrounds can wholeheartedly take an oath to support and defend the Constitution when they're naturalized, when they join the armed forces, when, like many of you, they gain admission to the bar, or they're sworn into elective office, not because of how our founding text was understood in 1787, or even how it was understood in 1870 when the Reconstruction Amendment served as a second founding, but because of how we understand the Constitution today. Now in recent decades, this understanding of the Constitution has been eclipsed by alternative conceptions of our founding document uh, that uh, are, I think, much narrower. So originalism, the idea that we should exclusively rely on public understandings of the text at the time it was ratified. Uh, or strict constructionism, the idea that you just have to pull out a copy of the Constitution the way Hugo Black did and read the words and the words tell you exactly what the document means. Those, I think, uh, are the predominant uh, ways in which people think about the Constitution today, or at least say they think about the Constitution. So what I'm going to try to do this afternoon with you is to describe and defend an alternative approach to constitutional interpretation that I think is richer than originalism or strict construction, that I think is more consistent with the history of our constitutional practice, and that better explains why our Constitution endures more than 200 years after the nation's founding. The way we need to think about the Constitution is to keep faith with the Constitution, by which I mean to interpret its words and apply its principles in ways, this, ways that preserve the Constitution's meaning and democratic legitimacy in our time. Original understandings are important to this way of interpreting the Constitution, but so too are other sources that judges, elected officials, and ordinary citizens look at when they talk about constitutional law. The purpose and the structure of the Constitution, the lessons that precedent and our history tell us, and the practical consequences of legal rules. So Constitution interpretation has to begin, I think, by being faithful to the character of the document itself. Uh, two features, I think, are particularly important. First, as the great Chief Justice John Marshall explained back in the early 19th century, the Constitution was intended to endure for ages and consequently to be adapted to the various crises in human affairs. It's therefore, I think, a charter of general principles open to fair and just interpretation over time. Second, the Constitution is a document that's designed to be understood by the public. To quote President Franklin Roosevelt, it's a layman's document, not a lawyer's contract. So let me just pause for a moment here and ask, how many of you are either lawyers or law students? 
So this is something you need to remember when you talk to real people. And for those of you who are real people, I shouldn't say real people as opposed to lawyers. And, but for those of you who are not lawyers or planning to be lawyers, I think um, that my talk will be accessible to you as well because I'm talking about something that's not a lawyer's contract. Uh, this is not like trying to explain the tax code to you uh, or your employee benefits uh, or uh, even how to get uh, the zoning board to approve something you want to do to your house. Uh, this is about a document that all Americans are entitled to interpret. Uh, and the interpretation of which is a product of what all Americans think about the document. Uh, so Franklin Roosevelt says it's a layman's document, not a lawyer's contract. And throughout our history, the meaning of the Constitution uh, has been subject to public debate and at times to intense mobilization by the American people and their representatives. Judges, of course, play an important role in interpreting the Constitution. But the popular character of the Constitution has meant that constitutional interpretation is not exclusively the province of the judiciary. So it's not surprising or illegitimate that judicial doctrine often incorporates understandings of the document's text that are forged through social movements, through legislation, or through historical practice. Indeed, public engagement with the meaning of the Constitution is what's enabled our founding document to retain its democratic authority through changing times. Now, I want to know how many of you have seen uh, either the C-SPAN version or the YouTube clips of the members of the House of Representatives reading the entire text of the Constitution at the beginning of the last legislative session. Did any of you see any of that? So a couple of you saw that, right? And you'll remember that when the House of Representatives announced it was going to do this, people thought it was a kind of cynical political ploy to propitiate the Tea Party in some way. And maybe it was, but it was also an extraordinarily moving moment. And I just want to uh, focus on one aspect of it for just a moment with you, which is uh, although they said they were going to read the whole Constitution, they didn't, in fact, read the whole Constitution. They left out some of the parts of it that have been amended away, most notably the importation of slaves clause uh, in Article 4, because there wasn't a member of Congress who wanted to get up on the floor and be filmed saying that, uh, and the three-fifths clause. And for the most part, all of the members of Congress lined up, and it was first come, first served for reading each little part of the Constitution. But there were a couple of members who were allowed to read provisions out of turn. And what I thought was most significant in some ways for our understanding of what our Constitution means today is one of those examples, which was uh, Representative John Lewis from Georgia was called on out of turn to read the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which is the amendment that provides that slavery except for as punishment for a crime, uh, uh, can't exist in the United States. And the reason this is very significant is John Lewis, as a 25-year-old graduate student, was one of the leaders of the Selma to Montgomery March that was one of the foundational uh, events in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and more than anything probably is responsible for passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which in two years, enfranchised more African Americans in the United States than had been enfranchised under the 15th Amendment in the previous 100 years. So when we think about what the 15th Amendment means in America today, we owe more to what John Lewis did as a layperson, as a student, the age that many of you in the audience are today, than we owe to the Supreme Court or to the drafters of the 15th Amendment themselves. So let me start with uh, talking about where our Constitution comes from so you can see what the nature of the document is with which we have to keep faith. Um, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his I Have a Dream speech, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every America was to fall heir. Dr. King was right to link these two documents because the Constitution was drafted and ratified against the backdrop of the recent war for independence with Great Britain, and the Declaration of Independence expressed in very important ways Americans' aspiration for the kind of government they envisioned. The Declaration of uh, Independence expresses a background understanding that equality, liberty, and opportunity, what the Declaration calls the pursuit of happiness, were fundamental inalienable rights, that legitimate government depends on the consent of the governed, 
and that the powers of government should be organized to enable it affirmatively to secure the blessings of liberty and to effect the E form of effect, not the A form, uh, the rights and liberties of our people. Now, the framers of our Constitution were also drafting the Constitution that we have against the background of a failed Constitution that didn't even last the 17 years that I told you the average Constitution lasts, which was the Articles of Confederation. And what was it about the Articles of Confederation that failed? They failed to create a national government with the necessary powers to deal with the pressing issues of the time. And so when our framers uh, drafted and then ratified the Constitution we have today, they knew that they were creating a nation that was going to change over time, that needed both protection for individual rights and a strong national government that was capable of dealing with the crises that would arise over time. So our Constitution is a visionary document. It advanced a new model for effective governance and for democratic rule, and its text and its principles uh, and its structure explain ways that we should be thinking about the Constitution today. Now, as the country has matured, the broad principles articulated in the Constitution have naturally been subject to ongoing debate. Each generation, though, has sought to remain faithful to these constitutional commitments through a process of interpretation and enforcement of the Constitution by Congress and the courts, which have in turn been informed by public deliberation and engagement. And I want to talk about two cases with you today that illustrate how the Constitution gets interpreted and why strict construction or originalism standing alone can't answer some of the most pressing questions. The first of the cases I want to talk about is a case called Heller against United States. Uh, Heller involved the Second Amendment to the Constitution, uh, which states that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The issue before the court in Heller was whether the Second Amendment barred the District of Columbia from enforcing its law prohibiting handgun possession against individuals who wanted to keep a handgun in their house for self-defense. Now, if you look at the opinions in Heller, which I should ask, have any of you done? Have any of you been forced to read the opinions in Heller? It's a whopping long case. But one of the things that I think you'll find, or the one of you who did, has read them has already found, uh, is that it would be a caricature to say that conservative judges decide cases based only on text and original meaning, while liberal judges ignore text and history uh, and de decide the cases instead on contemporary values or their own policies judgments, because it turns out all the justices do all of these things. That is, all of the justices talk about text. All of the justices talk about history. All of the justices talk about precedent. They all talk about values. They all talk about contemporary norms. And they all talk about social consequences. What divides them is the substance, not the method that they use to reach uh, their results. So for example, the five justices in the majority, uh, which held, in case you haven't heard yet, that uh, the Second Amendment does protect an individual's right to uh, have a handgun for self-protection. The five justices in the majority who thought that, uh, as well as the four dissenters, devoted a great deal of attention to parsing the text. Both sides relied on dictionaries, including dictionaries from the 18th century. Both sides relied on contemporaneous con con commentaries. Both sides were, uh, relied on grammarians to tell them what uh, uh, what's a dependent clause and what's an independent clause. Both sides were, uh, de relied on linguists to unpack the words of the amendment. The majority said, well, the right of the people, that's talking about an individual right in the same way that the Fourth Amendment's right of the people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures is about an individual right. Uh, and they, in the majority, read the phrase to keep and bear arms to refer generally to the possession uh, and use of weapons, including weapons for hunting or self-defense. The dissenters, by contrast, read the right of the people as a collective right. They said this isn't about individual rights. It's about the right of the people to form a militia. Uh, and they then said that uh, keeping and bearing arms is a phrase, sort of like rosy fingered dawn, for those of you who had to read the Odyssey in high school. Right? It, you can't take the words apart. Uh, 
ham and cheese sandwich, right, is not ham and cheese sandwich. It's one thing. And they said keeping and bearing arms suggests that this is talking about the military. Because most people don't say, I kept and, I kept and bore an arm to go and, and shoot deer. Right? They would say, you know, they, 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 when they think about keeping and bearing arms, bearing arms is what you take an oath to do when you join the military. It's, and so the two sides argued about the dictionary definitions, and they looked at dictionaries and the like. Each side also uh, relied on historical evidence, including English antecedents to the Second Amendment, the amendment's drafting history, provisions in state constitutions around the time, and statutes from the colonial and founding era. The majority said, look, there were a bunch of states that explicitly protected an individual's right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. And they said, that tells us what uh, the Second Amendment means. The dissenters, by contrast, said, well, if they had wa wanted to protect that, they would have used the same language the states used. So their decision to use different language shows that they meant something different. Uh, both sides also grappled with precedent. And this was an area where there wasn't a lot of precedent, but they spent an awful lot of time talking about the little precedent there was. And I just want to mention one of those precedents, which was a case from 1939 called United States Against Miller, in which a unanimous Supreme Court uh, held the possession of a sawed-off shotgun is not protected by the Second Amendment. Um, the dissenters uh, in Miller, uh, understood Miller to turn on the basic difference between military and non-military weapons. A sawed-off shotgun is never a military weapon. Therefore, uh, when the court said you can't, uh, you don't have a right to have a sawed-off shotgun, what they meant is you don't have a right to have a weapon that's not a military weapon. The majority, by contrast, read Miller to hold that the Second Amendment right extends only to certain types of weapons, those typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. And they couldn't see any way in which you would saw off a shotgun for a lawful purpose, as opposed to keeping it in your, uh, in your raincoat while you go in to rob a bank, as Miller had. Moreover, when they thought about applying the Second Amendment, uh, both sides in Heller demonstrated that the modern day application of a constitutional principle has to take into account contemporary social practices and the anticipated social consequences. Now, elsewhere you may know that Justice Scalia, who wrote the court's opinion uh, in Heller, insists that the Constitution's meaning is determined by how members of the founding generation would have understood it. But in his opinion for Heller, he adopts an interpretation of the Second Amendment that is marbled with understandings of what the contemporary practice and social conditions are. So let me talk about two of the questions that he had to answer in his opinion and show you how they depend on contemporary notions and have nothing to do with originalism at all. The first of these questions is what kind of arms are protected by the Second Amendment? Uh, and the second is what constitutes a forbidden infringement of a Second Amendment right? So as to the first question, Justice Scalia's opinion squarely and expressly rejects the idea that the word arms covers only the kinds of guns that were around in 1791. And here's what he said. He said, some have made the argument, bordering on the frivolous, that only those arms in existence in the 18th century are protected by the Second Amendment. We do not interpret constitutional rights that way. Just as the First Amendment protects modern forms of communication, and here he cited a case about the internet, and the Fourth Amendment applies to modern forms of search, and here he cited a case about thermal imaging devices, the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. In other words, you have more than just a right to carry a musket. That, that last sentence is mine, up until then I was quoting. Now why is this so? It's because many words in the Constitution are properly read for, to stand for broad principles. Here, the right to use technology or instruments for self-protection. But those words depend, on, and the practical meaning depends on interpretation that's responsive to evolving social conditions, including advances in technology. At the same time, the Supreme Court recognized that not all weapons available today fall within the Second Amendment scope. So if you were thinking of building a nuclear bomb at home uh, to defend you, uh, don't try it. Because as a historical matter, the court explained, the amendment accommodated the tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous or unusual weapons uh, and covered only arms of the kind in use at the time, since those were the kind of arms that men called for militia service would have brought with them. 
So in this way, the court reaffirmed its holding in Miller that the Second Amendment does not protect possession of a sawed-off shotgun. So what distinguishes a sawed-off shotgun from a handgun? Nothing about the text of the Constitution and nothing straightforwardly historical. What actually distinguishes them from one another is contemporary social practice. Or as Justice Scalia put it, the fact that handguns are the most popular weapon chosen for Americans by Americans today for self-defense in the home. By limiting the Second Amendment's protection to weapons in common use at the time, the court interpreted the constitutional provision to have what Justice Louis Brandeis once called the capacity of adaptation to a changing world. Indeed, just as a sawed-off shotgun is not what the American people have, continue, have considered to be the quintessential uh, weapon of self-defense, the American people may someday re, re, reach the same result about handguns. And if we can say that the common practice today of carrying uh, a handgun explains what the Second Amendment's right to bear arms is, Justice Scalia never explains why the common practice today, for example, of using contraception doesn't define what liberty is, regardless of what people would have thought it was uh, in the 18th century. Indeed, I figured out using um, census data and data from the uh, Center for Disease Control uh, and survey data that more American women have had abortions than carry handguns. And yet, Justice Scalia would say, because abortion was not a right in 1870, it's not a right today even though the common social practice is quite different than it was uh, in 1870 or the like. But even with respect to thinking about handguns, the court in Heller indicated its receptivity to a broad range of government regulation of handguns, including longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or, and of course, no surprise here, the Supreme Court uh, gave a shout out to uh, federal laws that forbid the carrying of firearms in government buildings. Now, many of you may know that the First Amendment applies in government buildings. There's a famous case, Cohen against California, uh, that involves someone wearing a jacket into a courthouse uh, on which he had the message, fuck the draft. We don't deny mentally ill people the right to uh, speak. Uh, they don't lose their First Amendment rights. So what is it that causes them to lose their Second Amendment rights? Nothing in the text. What causes them to lose their Second Amendment rights is a pragmatic argument, an argument about the consequences. And so even the majority is looking at the consequences today and the contemporary social practices. They're not deciding the case based solely on the text uh, standing alone uh, or on the understanding uh, from uh, the 1790s or the 1870s. Attention to real world consequences is an ordinary part of constitutional interpretation. It's what keeping faith with the Constitution requires. Because the Constitution is not a suicide pact. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a document designed to make a government that works and to enable us to have a society that maximizes human liberty. Now today, as throughout our history, Americans continue to face the task of applying our, our Constitution to new contexts. William Faulkner famously wrote once that the past is never dead, it's not even past. Uh, and we still have that problem with the Constitution. So the Constitution's text and principles have to be adopted to, have to, be adapted to changes in the world. Uh, constitutional law has only begun to consider the array of issues arising from the omnipresence of computers. How should First Amendment principles of free speech apply in cyberspace? To what extent do constitutional principles restrict government surveillance of electronic communications? Should the various doctrines governing campaign finance law apply to can candidates' uses of the internet? Let me give just one example of how technology uh, requires us to interpret the Constitution from a case decided earlier this term. Unanimously, it turns out, but with deep differences among the justices as to how to reason there. It's a case called United States Against Jones, uh, and it involves the question of whether the government's placement of a GPS device on the chassis of an automobile so that they could track the automobile where it was located every 10 seconds for a month constitutes a search. Because if it does constitute a search, then the Fourth Amendment comes into play. Uh, and the question then becomes, does the government need a warrant uh, to put one of these devices on a car, or is this the kind of search that the government can do uh, without a warrant? 
Now, the case arose, as I said, in the context of the government putting uh, a GPS device on the chassis of the Antoine Jones's car. They thought Antoine Jones might be involved in drug dealing. It turns out they were right. Uh, and um, the, what they were able to do from the GPS devices to show that he, his car went repeatedly uh, to a house from which drugs were being dealt at roughly the same time as other people's cars were there. Uh, and at the end of the day, it enabled the prosecutors to show at his, uh, his trial for conspiracy uh, to distribute cocaine that uh, he had been present uh, at various times when the cocaine was being distributed. Now, the United, States is gov the United States government's position in the case was fairly straightforward. Uh, the Solicitor General argued that the Fourth Amendment doesn't come into play here at all. Because when you're on a public street where your uh, activities are subject to view by anyone, you don't have any expectation of privacy that should be, uh, that should be protected. Because what a person knowingly exposes to the public uh, he knowingly exposes to the possibility that the government will, will know what's going on as well. So police don't generally, don't generally uh, perform a search uh, when they tail a car on public roads or if a policeman follows you around while you're walking on the street. That's not a search because all they're observing is what any member of the public might observe. Or if they stand next to you and sniff the air and detect a, a whiff of marijuana, they're not conducting a search because anybody could stand on the street and sniff you and know that you were smoking marijuana. So a tip for all of you who are going to be lawyers, if you're going to smoke marijuana, don't smoke it on the street. Um, in the government's view, a GPS device is just a more mechanical, more reliable, cheaper way of doing something that law enforcement was entitled to do all along. The Supreme Court unanimously disagreed with that. And I want to talk a little bit about the different opinions so you can see how they're interpreting the document in very different ways and what the costs and benefits of those different methods of interpretation are. Justice Scalia's opinion for the court, Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion, was joined by the Chief Justice, by Justice Kennedy, by Justice Thomas, and by Justice Sotomayor. That opinion held that the act of attaching the GPS device to the chassis of the car, that is, just going under the car and slapping the thing on the chassis, uh, was a search under the Fourth Amendment. And his analysis was essentially originalist, because what he said is, by, uh, by putting the device on the car, you had trespassed on the car. Sure, only about you know, a fraction of an inch, but that was a trespass. And when the government physically intrudes on your personal property, uh, that was what the 18th century understood a search to be. That is, if the government walked onto your property to look at things, that would be a search. Well, here, that's essentially what the government did. They walked under your car and attached something to your car. But that way of thinking about whether there's a search or not ignores some of the most critical issues about modern technology. It sheds no light, for example, on the question whether the government couldn't just put uh, a GPS device on every license plate before they issue the license plate. Because if it's on the license plate, the license plate is not your property. The license plate is the government's property. And so it's not a trespass. And you voluntarily take the license plate onto your car. I mean, you're compelled to do it if you want to drive around, but you're perfectly free not to have a car and not to have a license plate. So if that's the rule, then the government can just put GPS devices on every person's license plate, uh, and then there's no search at all. Uh, it also um, sheds no light on um, how to think about property in the digital age, because well, Justice Scalia's view has the attraction of being a nice bright line rule. If it's trespass, then it's a search. Uh, it doesn't recognize the fact that today, the most important form of privacy that many people have is not so much just physical privacy, but informational privacy. The problem in Jones's case is not that the GPS intruded a fraction of an inch onto the chassis of his car. The problem is that the GPS device provided literally reams of information about Jones's life, where he was every 10 seconds that he was in his car, and where his car was every 10 seconds of every minute of every hour of every day for a month. And that insight, 
that that's really the problem is actually something Justice Scalia is aware of. Because he wrote the opinion for the court in Cairo against the United States, which was the case that held that standing across the street from a person's house and using a thermal imaging device to figure out where the heat in their house was also constituted a search. This was another drug case in which uh, Mr. Kilo, who really, it's too bad he didn't pronounce his name Kilo, which would have made the case much more interesting. Uh, but he pronounced it Kilo, as opposed to Kilo, which was a case about takings, where it's not so interesting which way you pronounce it. Um, but Kilo uh, was growing marijuana in his basement. And to grow marijuana in your basement in the Pacific Northwest, which is where he lives, um, requires that you use grow lamps. Uh, and grow lamps use an awful lot of energy and an awful lot of heat. And so normally, you know, heat rises. So if you were to look at a normal house, the heat and, uh, on, under a thermal imaging device, the heat would all be at the top of the house because the heat is rising. But in Mr. Kyle's house, if you looked at it from across the street, the heat was all in the basement, which is very suspicious. So the police saw this by standing on the street and looking at the house and then went and got a warrant. But the court held that the very act of using the thermal imaging device was, uh, was a search. Now, why is that? Well, Justice Scalia says it's because the device is capable of really revealing intimate details about a target's life, the kind of details that the original understanding of the Fourth Amendment, regardless of trespass or not, were intended to keep private. And the example Justice Scalia used was kind of charmingly old-fashioned. He said, a device like this would tell you at what hour each night the lady of the house takes her daily sauna and bath. And presumably, if you got even more, uh, more sophisticated devices, you could see the outlines of the lady uh, in the same way that now, when you stand in line at the airport, you get that, those charming little sh shots of what you must look like on a backscatter uh, x-ray to people who, thank God, are many miles away from you when they're looking at you so they don't start to snicker and say, been eating a bit too much carbohydrates lately, eh? Now, the thing about this new technology is that I think it poses pr threats to privacy the differing kind and not just degree from the old style threats. Privacy was traditionally protected as much by practical constraints as by legal doctrine. The sheer cost of following people on the street, if the only way you could follow them is to have an actual officer follow them every minute of every hour of every day, uh, made it prohibitive. Right? The realistic risk that most of us would have our activities monitored by the government was very low if the government actually had to assign a live person to follow us around. But a GPS system slashes that cost to pennies a day. Moreover, because of the software the government now has, they can take the information they get from the GPS device and cross-tabulate it with all sorts of other information to know who you were having dinner with, where you were eating, uh, what you ate, how long you were there, who else was there, and the like. Uh, and this makes it much easier for the government to know everything you're doing than would have been true in the framers' generation. Now. Justice Scalia doesn't confront any of those questions in his opinion in Jones. And maybe he doesn't have to there because a narrow rule works for him. Now, let's talk about where Justice Alito was in the case. Justice Alito, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan, uh, wrote a concurring opinion, an opinion that concurred in the judgment. Uh, he reached the same bottom line as Justice Scalia, namely that Jones had been subjected to a search. But he strongly disagreed with how Justice Scalia had gotten there. Instead of grounding what he called analysis of a 21st century surveillance technique in what he dismissingly referred to as 18th century tort law, Justice Alito would have relied on the framework laid out by the Supreme Court in its 1967 decision in Katz against the United States. Uh, and that test asks, did the government's conduct violate what are called reasonable expectations of privacy? So Justice Alito's uh, framework is consciously flexible. It recognized that society's expectations might well change over time in response to changes in technology and social understanding. Uh, thus, for him, what was interesting was that long-term nature of the surveillance. That is, Justice Scalia would say, if they put the GPS on your car and they got two data points coming out of it, that would be a search. For Justice Alito, you could put it on the car for a week, maybe, and it wouldn't be a search at all. It was just it had been on the car so long. So he says relatively short-term monitoring of a person's movement, even by a GPS device, is not 
a problem. So notice here, it's not that Justice Alito's view is more protective of privacy, exactly. It's more protective in some ways, but less protective in others. And even more striking, and this is important for those of you who think that people who argue for uh, a, a, a kind of liberal view of the Constitution's and I don't mean liberal left-right here, but I mean a less strict constructionist view. Those of you who think that always works towards the left's advantage or it moves the Constitution inevitably towards the left should notice something else about Justice Alito's view, which is if people's understandings of privacy change for, so that people no longer expect certain details to be private, then those details won't be protected by the Constitution. So for those of you who are in the Facebook generation, uh, one of the things that's most striking, I think, to those of us who are, you know, have at least one foot and probably one foot and an arm in some of our cases in the grave, one of the things that's most striking to us is the amount of data and the amount of information that you make public that we would never have made public. <coughs> What that means over time, if you take Justice Alito's view, is there will come a time in which privacy that's protected today won't be protected because the average person no longer expects those details to be private. And that's where Justice Sotomayor's separate opinion uh, comes into play, which is although Justice Sotomayor joined Justice Scalia in saying this is a trespass and that's good enough, she staked out a far more privacy-protecting approach. She observed that in cases that involve these kind of novel uh, methods of surveillance, um, the court was giving nobody any guidance. And she noticed that the wealth of detail that things like GPS devices could provide about a person's family, their political, their professional, their religious, and their sexual associations, uh, information that could be uh, aggregated and mined for decades down the road, might show fundamental associational and expressive freedom. And she expressed a willingness to reconsider an issue that the Supreme Court decided about 25 years ago that I think is critical in the modern age, which is whether the Fourth Amendment protects your privacy in information that's controlled by a third party. Because you may know that right now the government does not need a warrant to get your phone records. They don't need a warrant to get your bank records because they can just issue a subpoena to the bank or to the phone company. If you give over your data to third parties, you're thought no longer to have a, a privacy interest in it. And she points out that in the modern world, you give over almost all of your data to a third party. Everything you send by email, unlike letters, which were understood to be private even when they were in the postal service, when you uh, have a Gmail account, if Google can go through your account and look for what's in there, then why can't the government too? And she said we need to rethink fundamentally in modern times how to think about Fourth Amendment privacy. Because that information is what people think of as private and it's not under current doctrine. Now the questions about how changes in the world play out in constitutional interpretation go on and on. What about scientific understandings? The Constitution has long recognized that principles of liberty and autonomy with respect to uh, intimate matters of family life are critical. How do those issues apply to abortion or to end of life issues in light of changes in medical understanding and our evolving understanding of human development and cognition? What constraints does the government impose on the government's collection and use of human DNA? You may have seen a front page story in the New York Times today about the state of New York is going to collect DNA from everyone convicted of a crime there. What powers might Congress have under the enforcement clauses of the 14th Amendment uh, to regulate state use of genetic testing? And it's not just changes in scientific understanding. Uh, changes in social understandings often and rightly change how constitutional principles are applied. Consider, for example, something that's going to be at the Supreme Court in the next year or two, litigation over the right to marry. State and local governments have always limited the right to certain, the right to marry to certain people under certain circumstances. Not until 1948, with the California Supreme Court's decision in Perez against Sharp, did any court suggest that the Constitution might forbid states from refusing to recognize interracial marriage. And it took an additional generation before the United States Supreme Court reached that conclusion in Loving against Virginia. In subsequent years, the court came to recognize the marriage rights of prisoners and the marriage rights of indigent individuals. Today, obviously, there's a vigorous debate over the right of same-sex couples to marry. That debate would have been unthinkable 
a half century ago, just as a debate over the right of interracial couples to marry would have been unthinkable a half century before that. Here, as in many other areas, our constitutional understandings have changed as the norms and values of our society has changed. And just as the framers could not have imagined the internet, there was a wonderful line in the uh, argument uh, two terms ago over violent video games. And California had a law that made it uh, illegal to rent or uh, sell violent video games to minors. Uh, and during the argument, Justice Scalia was asking about what the framers had understood about speech about violence. And Justice Alito leapt in and said, what Justice Scalia is asking you is what would James Madison have thought about violent video games? Well, if that's the question we can answer, he didn't think anything about them. If that's the answer, then the Constitution has nothing to say about violent video games because you know, grand theft, horse and buggy hadn't yet been invented. So he had nothing to say about that. And yet we all understand that the First Amendment has something to say about movies and it has something to say about video games. Uh, so just as the framers couldn't have imagined the internet, they couldn't have imagined DNA testing, they couldn't have imagined women's equality, there are undoubtedly social developments and constitutional questions that we can't imagine today. But if our national experience is any guide, I think we can be confident that the Constitution's text and principles will endure and they will adapt to these questions as well. So whatever allure there might be in theories that would reduce constitutional interpretation to a simpler and more mechanical process, those theories ultimately fail to explain our actual constitutional practice and its remarkable achievement over time. The American people adopted the Constitution in order to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. As our nation and the world continually change, constitutional interpretation that's faithful to those purposes enables and motivates each generation of Americans to keep faith with the Constitution. Thank you very much.